Hello everyone, welcome to Ideas and Insights. I am Badri Nath Rao, your host for this program. The history of humankind is the history of wars, punctuated by periods of peace. Since the dawn of civilization, the world has witnessed umpteen conflicts, invasions, aggressions, and genocides. The ongoing war in Ukraine, the Holocaust, the mass killings in Rwanda, Armenia, Bosnia, Darfur, Cambodia, Myanmar, and so on, all attest to our limitless capacity for violence. Yet, as gregarious, ultra-social animals who thrive in social groups, seek social interactions, and crave social solidarity, humans, according to psychologist David Grossman, have an innate aversion to killing. We have an inborn psychological mechanism for regulating aggression and restraining interpersonal violence. Besides, all cultures prohibit killing fellow human beings. We are thus caught between the contradictory pulls of our peaceful impulses and the need to disregard our common humanity in times of war. Resolving this paradox requires special indoctrination that lowers our inhibitions against senseless violence and killings. A commonly used strategy involves dehumanizing people we consider our enemies. Historically, we have dehumanized Jews, enslaved people, African Americans, the Romani, Armenians, the Uyghurs, and indigenous people in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. They have been described as lice, rodents, reptiles, vermin, pigs, pests, and insects. Something similar happens in our interpersonal relations too, mainly when we are mad at someone. We unthinkingly use animalistic slurs to insult our foes and diminish their humanity. Dehumanization is a complex polymorphous phenomenon that goes well beyond hurling epithets at people we dislike. It denudes people of their humanity and renders them vulnerable to abuse. Dehumanization euthanizes our moral compunctions and makes us prone to the most egregious forms of violence. It is predicated on a hierarchical worldview that we poorly understand and whose validity is suspect. The most pernicious aspect of this phenomenon is that it makes us feel good about ourselves by casting us as moral warriors in a Manichaean world. This apart, the myriad forms of dehumanization have an enduring appeal because they legitimize dominance, exploitation, and profiteering. Dr. David Smith, an eminent philosopher and professor of philosophy at the University of New England, has written a new book, Making Monsters, The Uncanny Powers of Dehumanization, exploring the philosophical and socio-psychological dimensions of dehumanization. Published last year by Harvard University Press, this densely argued yet accessible book offers seminal insights on dehumanization and explains why one should be mindful of its harmful consequences. Going beyond received wisdom on the topic, Dr. Smith posits that dehumanization is a kind of attitude that makes us simultaneously see people as subhuman and human. He locates dehumanizing tendencies in our stratified outlook on life and the world and belief in racialized and gendered relations of dominance. A singular strength of his work is its original thesis on how dehumanization leads to the creation of monsters and what we can do to resist them. With the rise of authoritarian leaders across the globe, Dr. Smith's work 
could not have come at a more opportune moment. He joins me now to discuss his ideas on dehumanization. Welcome to Ideas and Insights, Dr. Smith. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, uh, Padre, and please call me David. And I'm honored to have this conversation with you and the viewers. Your latest book, Making Monsters, The Uncanny Powers of Dehumanization, is the third book you have written on this topic. In 2020, you published another book on this issue titled Inhumanity, Dehumanization and How to Resist It, published by Oxford University Press. And prior to that, in 2011, you wrote Less Than Human, Why We Demean, Enslave and Exterminate Others. Let me begin by asking you, what drew you to the study of dehumanization and why do you think this is an important topic? Oh, let me, oh, before answering that, let me say that your summary of my, my views was really excellent. Thank you. Really impressive, thank you. You've clearly read carefully and thoughtfully. Uh, so let's start with the second question you just asked me first. It's important because dehumanization is involved in the very worst things that human beings inflict on one another. The most terrible things, for instance, genocide. Every genocide that I've studied over that took place over the last, say, 150 years has involved dehumanization. So, you know, if, if we want to intervene, if we want to prevent these terrible things from repeating and repeating and repeating, we need to understand the mechanisms involved. And that's why we need to understand dehumanization. Now, what inspired me to start looking at this? Well, there are a couple of ways I can answer that question. I think probably the most important is I grew up in the Deep South during the Jim Crow era, and I lived in an extended family. Uh, my grandparents were Jewish refugees from Eastern Europe. So I was confronted with the dehumanization of, of, of African Americans in the world in which I lived. And I was also party to the stories of the persecution and dehumanization of Jews in, in Eastern Europe. And those two things left a deep impression on me. Uh, later on, as a, as a scholar, as a philosopher, I started exploring the literature on dehumanization and found two things. One is almost all of it at the time was written by psychologists. And the second was, I thought that that literature was really, really inadequate, largely because to understand humanization, you can't just, you can't only look at what goes on in people's minds. You have to look at the social and political forces that get people to think about other people the way they do, which inspires these acts of, of terrible violence and oppression. It's interesting, Dr. Smith, that your formative influences uh, drew you to this topic. And I must mm -hmm. say, having read the book closely, that you do have very original insights on this uh, matter. Uh, right at the outset, in chapter one of your book, you begin by clarifying what, according to you, dehumanization is not. So you say <laughs> dehumanization is not just degrading treatment. Dehumanization is not just treating someone as mindless and subhuman, and dehumanization is not about uh, uh, looking down on people. It's not about derogation. It's not metaphorical, mm -hmm. rhetorical, and so on. You also say that dehumanization is not necessary for committing atrocities. Mm -hmm. And then you posit that dehumanization is a kind of attitude which involves treating people as subhuman. So let's begin with an account of what you think is the kernel of dehumanization. 
So the, why that chapter was necessary because dehumanization, the word dehumanization is used in many, many different ways. Mm -hmm. you know, it was introduced into the English language in the early 19th century. And since that time, it's accumulated lots of different meanings. Now, it, it, it would be incorrect of me to say that there is one right, one correct understanding of dehumanization. We have a lot of choices here. So I wanted to make the case for my particular conception of dehumanization and to, to explain why I prefer that conception to other conceptions. So for me, to dehumanize others is to conceive of them as less than human creatures. Now, conceiving of them, that's an attitude. That's something that happens in our heads. Um, as less than human creatures, I chose those words very carefully. Uh, I didn't say as subhuman animals. I said as less than human creatures. And I said that because in the most toxic and the most dangerous forms of dehumanization, dehumanized people are not thought of as simply as animals, but as demonic, monstrous, evil creatures. Uh, so that's that's really at the core of of my view, my view of dehumanization. And I think it's very, very important to be precise about what one means when one uses the term, partially because if if one is not precise, scholars and non scholars actually talk past each other. You know, we're using the word in different ways. And I think it's very, very important to distinguish dehumanization as a phenomenon from other phenomena, which I would describe as next door. So dehumanization is not the same as misogyny. It's not the same as ableism. It's not the same as racism, although it's very, very closely related to racism. And the reason that that's important is because these are all terrible things. And if we want to do something about them, we need to attend to their unique dynamics, right? And, and, and so that's why I emphasize making these distinctions. You make very interesting uh, points about the relationship between racism and dehumanization. We will come to that momentarily. Let me ask you a follow-up question concerning your definition. Early mm -hmm. on in the book, you say that dehumanization is about seeing people as having human appearance and mm -hmm. subhuman essence. Yeah. So essentially, these are folks who are subhumans trying to pass off as humans. Exactly. What do you mean yes. by that? Yes, so um, there's a difference that we all intuitively make between what a thing is and what it appears to be right and and we're all open to the idea that something can appear to be something different than it is uh in cases of dehumanization and, and the full story here as as you know because you've read the book is is kind of complex and i imagine we're going to get to the details mm -hmm. is that when we dehumanize others, we grant that they appear to be human, All right? So, you know, if you are a Nazi and I am a, a Jewish man, which I am, by the way, uh, you know, you would look at me and say, yeah, of course he looks human. But on the inside, where it really matters, he's not human at all, he's something else. Uh, so when we dehumanize others, we think of them as sort of counterfeit humans, uh, fake humans. All right, the next point that I need to seek clarification on while on this topic of uh, definitions concerning dehumanization has to do with the contradictory perspectives people hold, particularly those who dehumanize hold about others. On the one hand, dehumanization is about 
inferiorizing people. But at the same time, those who do so <laughs> also attribute to them physical and mental powers that are considerable, something that scholars refer to as the superhumanization bias. So you have these two yes. uh, contradictory forces at play. Someone is inferior and at the same time has physical and mental prowess that is truly scary. How do we understand this? Mm -hmm. So we have to understand inferior in a, in a very specific sense. Uh, when we dehumanize others, and I use the word we because we're all capable of this, right? It's not just some people, it's we're all capable of it. Uh, we think of them as what philosophers would say is morally inferior. And what that really means is we think of them as having less value, less intrinsic value um, than us, <laughs> you know, whoever we are. Uh, that's perfectly compatible with them uh, having superhuman capacities. So let me give you a couple of examples. So if we go to the, uh, the Holocaust, the Third Reich in Germany, Nazis were quite clear. They thought Jewish people were diabolically intelligent, mm -hmm. right? They're controlling the world. I mean, that's superhuman in a way. Adolf Eichmann, one of the architects of the of the final solution said this quite explicitly he said the Jews they're smarter than us but they're of less value they're inferior in that way um, uh, similarly say with African Americans um, anti-black racism in the United States attributed superhuman powers to to black people particularly black males um, uh, insensitivity to pain great physical strength, tremendous sexual appetites, and so on and so forth. That's entirely compatible with, with white people thinking of black people as, well, as, as their lives not mattering because they have less intrinsic value than, than white people in that frame of, of reference. So those two, those two things go together. In the context of colonialism, for a very long time, white colonists routinely denied that Africans had a soul. We yeah. had similar uh, claims with respect to African Americans here in the United States. Can you explain yeah. to us the significance of this denial? Sure. What is it so that it goes they want back to, to the, It goes back to the essence appearance distinction. Mm -hmm. So if I can explain a little bit more about the, that, and then I'll, I'll um, address the specifics of your question. So there's a lot of psychological research on a tendency that human beings seem to have worldwide, which is called psychological essentialism. And that's the idea that there are different kinds of living things. And what makes any individual a member of one of those kinds it's not how it looks, but some deep characteristic that's unobservable, but is causally responsible for appearance. Um, it's often imagined to be in the DNA or in earlier centuries in the blood. Um, so that essence historically in Christian Europe was associated with the possession of a human soul. So if we go back, say, to the 17th century, uh, people often believed that what made someone human was their possession of a human soul. Sometimes it was called a rational soul in the philosophical tradition stemming from Aristotle. Uh, so if you wanted to deny humanity, you denied that these others had a soul. Um, now, there were, there were great debates about this in the colonization of what's now Latin America, right? Was, was it legitimate to, to enslave Native Americans? Well, it depended on whether they had a soul or not. Mm -hmm. 
somewhat later, there were questions about whether it was legitimate to enslave Africans. Well, the question rested on whether or not Africans had a soul. And of course, it was advantageous to those who made vast amounts of money off the backs of colonized and enslaved people to deny that they had souls and therefore to deny that they were human beings. Interesting. Let's now come to the relationship between racism and dehumanization. Speaking for myself, mm -hmm. I found this chapter in your book very interesting. And you say oh, that racializing people is the first step to dehumanizing them. What is the nexus yes. between these two uh, phenomena? It's twofold. So racializing others, and I guess I should explain what racialization is, which I will in a moment, is a preliminary to dehumanizing them. And it's preliminary to dehumanizing them because racial thinking and dehumanization conform to the same pattern. So, um, in there's a branch of philosophy called philosophy of, of race. Um, there are various views on the reality or unreality of race amongst philosophers of that nature. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details unless you press me to do so. Suffice it to say that I'm one of those philosophers who regards race as a toxic fiction right there there's human variation to be mm -hmm. sure <laughs> uh, but the idea of race is different than that the idea of race is sort of a folk explanation of why there is this pattern why are they these patterns of, of variation amongst human beings now if you look historically at racial beliefs so one thing is really really clear Races are manufactured in response to social and political and economic forces. Mm -hmm. That is, in situations of conflict, in situations where one group of people sees it as advantageous to harm, to enslave, to abuse another group of people, one of the first steps is to think of that other group of people as belonging to a separate race. Now. What's involved in that? I think there are three factors. To, to think of others as racialized, this is the process of racialization. One thinks of them as, first of all, fundamentally, essentially different from us. Mm -hmm. And that's a life sentence, right? That can't be changed. Second, inferior to us. And third, the idea is that this status is, is transmitted by descent. So it's handed down most frequently. There are some cultural variations on this, but most frequently from parents to offspring, right? Now, scientifically, this is all fiction. This is all garbage, but it's a very compelling idea. So you notice something about that story. In my view, racism is built into the very idea of race. To racialize a group of people is to denigrate them, is to think of them um, as lesser human beings. Um, so we have a kind of demotion on a hierarchy, right? They're human, yeah, but they're kind of inferior human beings. And uh, this then gives rise to rather paternalistic notions that one finds in colonialism and slavery and so on. Oh, they're like children or they're like, you know, they're simple minded and we're actually doing them a favor by enslaving them and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Um, so, so that hierarchical notion of higher and lower, that's built into the idea of race. Um, essentialism is too. So when people think racially, Remember, there's that first point I made, of they are fundamentally different from us. Well, they have a different, a racial essence, right? And that's unchangeable. So there's like some basic difference, according to this way of thinking, between, let's say, white people and black people. These racial constructs 
work differently in different societies. This is the paradigmatic American version, right? Right. Um, so in demoting people racially, behavior which would be impermissible with respect to treating others of, of our kind, right? Um, now, dehumanization, in my previous book, the book before this one on inhumanity, I described dehumanization as racism on steroids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so rather than think of the other simply as lesser human beings, we think of them as less than human beings. That is, they are expelled from the category of the human. And of course, this makes permissible much more violent, um, dangerous treatment. You know, of course, there, if a mosquito were to fly through this room and I would spot it, I would think, well, it's only a mosquito. Uh, similarly, when people are seen as less than human, not simply as lesser humans, it licenses their extermination they're, you know, terrible, terrible forms of, of abuse and, and denigration. So first step, racialization, second step, dehumanization. We see this pattern repeating again and again historically. I have a quick follow-up question with respect to racialization. Uh, you talk about the racialist mindset uh, or racial mm -hmm. essentialism which you say is a subset of psychological essentialism which provides the bedrock for dehumanization. What is this essentialist mindset? What are its consequences and how can we get out of it? Sorry for asking a compound question. But no, no, that's <laughs> fine. It's such an important question. So bear with me. So in 1989, there was a very important psychological research paper published called Psychological Essentialism. That's the origin of the term. Mm -hmm. And the authors argued that we human beings have a psychological disposition to do two things. One is to divide the world of living things up into what we philosophers call natural kinds, like separate distinct kinds of things, like biological species. And second, to um, hold, and this is an intuitive kind of natural thing for us, that what makes any organism a member of one of those kinds, one of those categories, is not anything observable about it, but something on the inside. Mm -hmm. And they gave the word essence to that. You know, it's part of a long philosophical tradition goes back to Aristotle, the idea of an essence. Um, so what makes a porcupine a porcupine is not how it looks, because after all, you might have a mutant porcupine that doesn't have any quills or is a strange color or has extra legs or whatever, and it's still a porcupine. But it's what it is on the inside. Similarly, in our discussion of the soul, the possession of a soul, it was believed um, in Europe, in the United States, uh, centuries ago, that what makes a human being a human being is not how they look, but it's possession of a human soul. That's the essence. People who know nothing about genetics would say the same about the genome nowadays. Mm -hmm. We have various versions of this, this, this idea. So uh, th that's basically how essentialism works. Um, can we get rid of it? And would that be desirable even? I don't know. That's an open question. I, I doubt. I doubt if we can dispense with essentialism. It seems so fundamental to the way that human beings address the world around them. We can, though, override those tendencies. We can remind ourselves that this is scientifically nonsensical, you know, the world doesn't work that way. And so we can, if, if we, if we're vigilant, we can resist falling into that pattern of thinking. And that's very important because 
Look, in many contexts, it's innocuous. It doesn't do any harm at all. If I think, you know, the blackbird that I'm, I'm looking out my window right now, I see a blackbird. If I think that has a blackbird essence, it's not harming anyone. If we start thinking of human beings as having racial essences, right? Uh, that is dangerous and and wrong and and just awful. So. It, it's only learning about these tendencies that gives us any hope of resisting them in the in the arenas where it really, really matters. I will come back to this question about strategies for tackling uh, the deleterious consequences of essentialism while discussing how we should resist dehumanization much later if we have time. But for now, let mm -hmm. me now turn to uh, the question of treating people as subhuman. It's premised on a hierarchical uh, outlook on the biosphere, which ranks some people high and some others low, and uh, some creatures low. And uh, this is the idea that you mentioned, the great chain of being. Mm -hmm. You also point out that this idea has been debunked. It's discredited. It's an intellectual artifact. But it continues to engage the minds of a lot of people. But then, while discussing this topic, you make an interesting point. You say this whole idea of hierarchy is something that morality engenders. What is the <laughs> connection between hierarchy and morality? OK. So um, the great chain of being is the title of the one book on this subject which was <laughs> published in the 1930s. And it's a tremendous work of scholarship. It's written by a, a philosopher and historian of ideas named Arthur O. Lovejoy. Mm -hmm. And although it's a tremendous work of scholarship, I think it's mistaken in a couple of respects. So what Lovejoy argues is there is this idea that arose in Europe in late antiquity that the entire universe is organized as a hierarchy with the most perfect beings at the top and the least perfect at the bottom so traditionally god was at the top as the supremely perfect being and then there were the archangels and the angels and we human beings modestly placed ourselves just below the angels and then various forms of animal life down, down, down to inanimate matter. So everything that exists has a rank in this. And the lower a thing is, the, le the, least perf the, least, the less perfect it is. And therefore, it can be treated differently than the, the higher things, right? Um, now, what did Lovejoy get wrong about that? Well, two things. One is that he said this way of thinking disappeared in the late 18th or early 19th century in Europe, and that's utterly false. To use my example earlier, if a mosquito were to fly through this room and I swatted it, and you were to say, what, what a terrible act. How could you destroy that mosquito? I say, well, it's only a mosquito, right? So I'm saying, in, in effect, this is a lower being. Its life doesn't matter. Um, second, it's the idea is much more widespread. It, we find it all over the world. We find it in African philosophy. We find it in Indian philosophy. We find it in Chinese philosophy. We find it in pre-contact indigenous American philosophy. So it's not just this sort of European idea that arose a couple of thousand years ago and disappeared. It's built into our moral psychology. Well, why? Um, I, I think it exists because it solves a problem. I call that the problem of killing. So all living things directly or indirectly feed off of other living things, right? We, you know, homo sapiens, continue to exist mm -hmm. because of our capacity to exploit other organisms, to hunt, to kill, 
And frankly, even if you're a vegan, you're taking the lives of carrots and broccoli and <laughs> plants or organisms too. All right. So here's the principle life feeds on life. But as human beings, um, we need to find reasons why it's permissible to kill or to exploit some kinds of beings and not others. And it's very, very, very important that part of that involves it being impermissible to kill and to exploit one another in our communities. And of course, it's just linked to a larger story about human sociality and, and so on, but we'll leave it at this for now. So the, the idea of the hierarchy of nature was a way of dealing with that problem. Mm -hmm. Right. OK. Human beings are ranked high on the hierarchy. Therefore, um, it's relatively impermissible for us to kill one another or to seriously harm one another. But of course, we found ways around that, too. But the idea of a hierarchy gives us some moral justification for for hunting other animals for exploiting their labor, for killing them, for killing and consuming plants and fungi, and so on. So it's part of our moral framework. And, you know, paradoxically, that very moral framework is then used to justify desperately immoral acts. One aspect of uh, morality is this assertion of human exceptionalism. And there's a yeah. long tradition of that. And yeah. it's also called anthropocentric prejudice. And yeah. so there is this argument that people are special because God made them special. Aristotle says that people are special because they have unique moral sensibilities. Medieval mm -hmm. philosophers said that they're special because they have the rational faculty. Uh, can't ascribe to them human dignity for this reason as moral agents. And then, of course, there's freedom of will, which some argue it makes people unique. You reject mm. all of that, citing the problem of marginal cases. You say that if we embrace any of these notions, then we get run into problems with, say, infants and cognitively impaired individuals. We have to either exclude them, which is dehumanizing them, or we will have other sorts of issues. Now, my question to you is, in the case of infants, for instance, might it be that we could uh, argue that their rational faculties, their moral sensibilities, and so on are latent, and so there is something to be said about not uh, ignoring that aspect of the issue? You could. You could do that. But of course, you still run into problems with cognitively impaired people. Um, True. The, the fact is, any of those moves are going to run you into problems. And there's a reason for that. Because what people are doing when they're making these cases for human specialness, they're starting with the assumption of human specialness and then trying to rationalize it. Uh, it's what the philosopher, um, oh gosh, what's his name? But, Slipped my mind. Uh, a philosopher uh, called the human prejudice. Oh, uh, Bernard Williams. That, Bernard Williams, yes, exactly. Thank you. Williams called it the human prejudice. Right. So that's what we start with. And there's a reason why we start with that. And that has to do with the nature of the human animal. Human beings, and this is uncontroversial, are highly, highly, highly social beings. There is no other mammal that is remotely as social as as our species. Um, and if you think about the implications of that, um, high level, levels of sociality, what, what biologists call ultra sociality, <laughs> imposes certain constraints on us, right? We can't be ripping each other's throats out. You can't, you can't maintain a way of social life in, in that way. So 
just as the kind of organisms we are, we have to treat one another as special. That's just built in. Um, but again, human beings are always looking for reasons. And sometimes those reasons are rationalizations. They're stories that we invent to justify something that's just there. And I think this whole tradition of um, uh, human exceptionalism is an exercise in rationalization of just a basic fact about human sociality. It's just there. That's how we've been evolved. Um, so that's my view. And if you look at the history of it, there's some pretty ridiculous ideas. It well, was a, a medieval belief, for instance, that, well, humans are special because unlike other animals, we can look up. <laughs> the idea is looking up a gut. Well, someone pointed out camels can look up too. Does that make them special? No. <laughs> All right. Let's now uh, move on to the relationship between uh, nature and hierarchy. There is an argument uh, coming out of religious traditions that um, our social arrangement should reflect the natural uh, world and should incorporate the uh, principles on which the natural world is organized. And uh, they, from that argument, move on to say that people are preordained to discharge certain roles. They have certain status mm -hmm. in life. And that's just the way it is. Now, you mm -hmm. obviously don't agree. You say that this is uh, a destructive idea and it has grave consequences. Can you explain why and what the yeah, consequences yeah. are? So if we look at human societies, um, any human society, there are a set of rules or norms and conceptions about how things should should go, right? Um, now, um, what is typical of human societies is that there's some justification offered for that. So it's not like, well, we just prefer to live this way. What human beings try to do is ground their, their social systems in something they regard as greater. Um, in, and very typically, it's the natural order of things, what's taken to be the natural order of things. Uh, now, this is not when people talk about natural, often they distinguish that way of thinking from religious ideas. But in fact, you know, historically, that's not the case at all. The, the natural order is what God or the gods have ordained and so on. And so the, the social social systems, there are stories made up by human beings which <laughs> attempt to justify social systems in in some belief about the natural order, what should be. And that means that um, any violation of social norms is seen as an affront to the natural order and, and needs to be eliminated. The order needs to be um, um, restored. And insofar as the, the natural order is associated with religious ideas, it's an affront to, to God or the gods themselves, right? And and so it's in fact an act of piety to restore the natural order. Well, why is this dangerous? Well, it depends on your conception of the natural order. So <laughs> here's here's one historically popular conception of the natural order. Women should be subservient to men. We find Aristotle's that in a lot probably. of religious traditions and a lot of conceptions of of just how things naturally are. Well, if, if, if you believe that, then you are committed to the oppression of women. If, if, if you think that race and therefore superiority, intrinsic superiority and inferiority are part of the natural order, then you are committed to racial oppression. So this is a a prevalent, I, I think it's a near universal social conception, um, which can have really awful moral and political consequences. But but again, it's it's kind of hard to escape. I mean, 
the Declaration of Independence talks about our in being endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. Well, there we have it, right? Right. Our society is grounded in this bigger, you know, cosmic plan and inalienable rights are just fine. Unfortunately, those in, in unalienable rights in, in colonial United States were reserved for land owning white men. Absolutely. And there's no getting around uh, that fact. Um, Let's yeah. move on to something else that you uh, mention in your book. You point out that human beings are ultra social. They have the ability to synchronize their uh, work and their actions. And they believe in cooperative uh, and collaborative work, all of which makes them want to be in the company of others, want social solidarity and so on. And so when yeah. they're asked to kill, or maim or hurt, they uh, go through moral injury or uh, you know trauma. Literally, mm -hmm. it's a traumatic yeah. uh, uh, event, and uh, there are people who talk about the uh, perpetrator uh, abhorrence, perpetrator mm -hmm. disgust, and so on. Now, while all of this is true, the fact remains that wars have not ended and are not likely to end anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So how do we reconcile these two uh, yeah. views? Yeah, that's a great question. Really at the core of what drives dehumanization amongst other sort of toxic um, practices. Um, so in all of my books, I, I mentioned Freud. And one of, I think, the most important things of Freud are not the details of his theory, but his recognition of the contradictory nature of, of human beings. That we are not uniform, we're, we're creatures of contradiction. There are forces that pull us simultaneously in different directions. So, as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. um, highly social beings, well, actually start with more modestly social beings. There's lots of social animals. And one characteristic of any social animal is inhibitions against acts of violence to community members. Now, th the reason for that is obvious. You can't have a community <laughs> if there's rampant violence against community members, right? So there have to be these inhibitions. I, uh, human beings as ultra social um, have ex very extended social networks between communities. And we know this has been going on since deep into prehistory. We know from evidence of long distance trade, for instance, that requires that right. attitude of interaction, solidarity, trust, and so on. Uh, okay, so what does that imply? It implies that we human beings have a natural aversion to acts of lethal violence against one another and even sublethal violence. Now, it sounds like the world would be a pretty good place if that was true, but the historical record is littered <laughs> with corpses. It's littered with oppression and slavery and, and genocide. Well, how can we make sense of that? I think this is the way we can make sense of this, that we, we're equipped with these great big brains, and we're capable of recognizing that, say, the small community that we might be a member of would benefit materially from inflicting harm on others. Those other people at the other side of the hill, you know, if, if we could uh, seize all their resources, we would be much better off. Problem there is, of course, the inhibition <laughs> against acts of violence. You, we can't just go off. Um, if you're not a, a sociopath, it's like four percent of the population, right? You, mm -hmm. It's the act of killing is psychologically very difficult, and this is evidenced in many different ways. In Absolutely. the homicide capitals of the world, there's still very few homicides. Um, so we humans with these great big brains have worked out cultural technologies 
for disabling inhibitions selectively. So here, and dehumanization is only one of those. So the use of, uh, of drugs and toxicants to disable uh, inhibitions, that goes back probably into prehistory. Certain religious ideologies True. and mind altering religious rituals. Again, very common practices before, say, oh, bloodshed warfare. The promise of paradise. Oh, yeah, the promise or, or the idea that the gods want you to do this. Um, the um, Another is the creation of long distance weapons where mm -hmm. you're not confronted with the cues of slaughter. Correct. You know, dropping a bomb on people, you're, it, you're not confronted with the things that elicit the attitude of a, of aversion, uh, and dehumanization is is one of these. When, and 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 this is a little bit. There's a little bit more to say about that. So if we think of the other as a subhuman creature, as a game animal, as a predator, as a traditionally unclean creature, or more extremely and unfortunately more commonly, as a monstrous demonic evil being, then that liberates aggression. But even this doesn't happen naturally. Typically, it's people in positions of power and influence who have an investment in us doing these mm -hmm. acts of harm that convince us that these aren't really human beings, you know, these are, these are monsters, these are demons, these are vermin. And we owe it to ourselves to exterminate them. And in mm -hmm. fact, typically the propaganda is we're saving the world from evil That's right. by doing these things. Every genocide I can think of is, is highly, highly moralistic in this way. Now, so to transition now to the other aspect of the question you asked me, that means that in committing these acts, we're having to override something very basic about being a human being. And this is damaging. This is something that has not been emphasized until relatively recently, that the act of killing itself is not some, particularly when it's up close and personal, it's not just difficult, it harms the killer. And that's where we get the trauma, the trauma of killing. Uh, you know, we, we talk about PTSD as though it were a you know, a case of the flu you come back with. Well, veterans are under a huge mm -hmm. moral and psychological burden. Right. And contemporary American society and European society are really quite insensitive to that. Other cultures and other times, people were much more aware of this. And engaged in rituals of purification and, and so on, sometimes for for a very, very long time before the uh, the combatant was permitted to re-enter normal society because they understood that one is tainted by the act of killing. Dr. Smith, we are almost out of time. I have two very quick questions and I'd appreciate it. Okay, I'll please. try to give you two quick answers. That's right. Question number one, um, what is your idea of monsters and how are they created? Okay, I'll try to do this quickly, although it's a complicated subject. Indeed, it is. Right, so when the propagandist gets us to think of the other as, say, vermin, as a traditionally unclean animal that needs to be eliminated, we accept that because, you know, they're supposed to know, they're, they're in charge, they're the, 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 the religious authority or the or the great scientist or the or the, the politician that we place our faith in and so on. We take it on board very all too often. But at the same time, because we are ultra social, we cannot help seeing the other as a human being. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at me. Suppose some person has convinced me that that Jewish people are not really people, they're vermin. And let's say you accept that. But at the same time, particularly the sight of a human face, you just cannot help seeing human. There's a basic responsiveness to that. So what's going on there then? You have two images of the other at the same time. 
human and subhuman. And those together, taken together, transform me into a monster. Um, there's a whole area of what's called monster theory that mm -hmm. deals with this sort of phenomenon. So, so that's what happens in the most dangerous, the most toxic forms of dehumanization. That it, right. it, paradoxically, it's our inability to see other members of our species simply as subhuman animals that leads us to the, the worst, most dangerous, the most horrific forms of dehumanization. This is very interesting, Dr. Smith. I have to ask you one last question before I bring this interview to a close. Uh, okay. I would like you to share with our viewers your strategies for resisting dehumanization. I know you explored this idea at length in your previous book on inhumanity. Mm -hmm. If you could very briefly, I'm sorry, there's not much time, tell us That's fine. how That's one fine. can resist dehumanization. One is understanding that we're all potential dehumanizers and we should resist dehumanizing the dehumanizers. We should not say that Hitler is a monster. Hitler was a human being. I'm, Jew I'm a Jewish person, I can say that, right? <laughs> the worst things are done by human beings, right? We have, to under we have to understand and constrain our tendency towards hierarchical thinking and essentialism. If we can't banish them, we can at least monitor them. Uh, we have to avoid being scared by politicians who want us to harm others. Institutions that can help us resist a free press, freedom of speech, uh, uh, independent judiciary. We need to do all of it, everything in our power politically to secure and maintain those things. They're not bulletproof. They can all be subverted, but it's the best that we have. Finally, I think what's very, very important is that the tendency to go along with authoritarian politicians who are the most, they're the big villains in this, this story, comes from their exploitation of our sense of vulnerability. They scare us into thinking that these others are invading and, and, and they're rapists and they're murderers and, and so on, and they're just beasts and animals and we have to kill them. Making sure that people are not object, rather, let me put it differently, creating conditions of life, socially and politically, where people are objectively less vulnerable. They have enough to eat, they have jobs. They're not, un, they're not terrified of the police and so on. That makes them, in my view, less receptive to dehumanizing propaganda, less receptive to the to the the propaganda of people in positions of power that have an interest in us harming other other human beings. These are powerful strategies. Thank you for sharing them with us, Dr. Smith. It's a great pleasure talking to you. We are grateful to you for taking the time to share your thoughts on dehumanization with us. Thank you very much and have a pleasant evening. Thank you so much, Padre. Bye-bye. That's it for this episode of Ideas and Insights. Thanks for joining us today. In the coming weeks, we will discuss Rewired, Protecting Your Brain in the Digital Age, a new book by Dr. Carl Marcy, published by Harvard University Press this year. Dr. Marcy offers scientifically supported solutions for everyone who wants to restore their tech-life balance, renew neglected relationships, and lead emotionally fulfilling lives. Watch out for an exciting discussion with Dr. Carl Marcy in the coming weeks. Until then, stay safe and goodbye.